Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is legendary artist Brian Ballin. Brian, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you very much for having me. Brian, you are known for uh, some of the, the most famous covers of the 1990s and 2000s here uh, in the United States working for DC Comics. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about when you are given a, an assignment for a cover, how do you sort of handle it? Is the editor telling you what the story is about? Or are you just <coughs> drawing something and hoping that it works? How do you approach those covers? Well, it's been different over the years. I mean, right at the very beginning when I first went to DC, I went to Marvel too a couple, few times, but I've mostly worked for DC. And I, I know the DC characters because I grew up with, uh, I had a large collection of DC comics, so I knew the characters rather well. And at the very beginning, I met um, Julius Schwartz, the legendary Julius Schwartz, who's a, he'd been an editor at uh, DC right through the 50s, I believe. And he um, said, look, um, you're coming to visit us in New York draw a couple of covers for us and we will work a, a story around them. And I, I came up with a Superman cover and a Justice League, some Justice League covers. But um, later on, I was doing the uh, maxi series Camelot 3000 and that was all very sort of tightly written and sorted out. I mean, I mean the very, the first two covers I did for Camelot 3000 were laid out, drawn in pencil by uh, Ross Andrew, who, who was a veteran artist in DC, and I just had to copy what he'd drawn. Since then, it's, it's gone through various phases. Uh, uh, sometimes I'm reading the entire script and looking for something in there that I think would make a very good cover. Sometimes the writer has an idea what he'd like on the cover. So really it changes every time. When I was doing covers for Grant Morrison's books, um, sometimes I had a complete free reign, thanks to editor Shelley Bond, to, to come up with something of my own devising. So occasionally, uh, the writer of Grant Morrison would uh, tell me exactly what he wanted. So it, do, it does vary from time to time. I think that's, that's one of those um, things that we see now. A lot of covers are, are maybe just what we would call pinups in the day. Um, but your yeah. covers generally had something to do with the, the, the story. And I think back to those great covers you did for Animal Man uh, that were just, you could look at those books and just, there was something about uh, you know, your cover work that was uh, just a, a notch above everyone else's. And I think of that oh, famous thanks. one where we sort of see you drawing in the figure and, and Buddy's kind of lying in the, uh, in the, the ground uh, like he'd been hit yes. by a car or something. So when you get an idea like that, um, you know, it seems like there's a lot of thought that goes into it and there's a lot of work that goes into the artwork. Your art is very detailed. So how are you uh, sort of approaching the page when you have the idea to, to put it on there? Uh, when is it going to be ink? When's it going to be color? I, I, I can't remember specifically how I came up with each of those covers, but um, there was something very meta about um, uh, Grant Morrison's writing on Animal Man. And uh, on the occasion of the, I think it was number four, or was it the one with um, um, the, my hand on, well, actually I drew my hand on, on, on the cover there, the mustard to, to tell the truth, it was quite a long time ago. I can't remember exactly how the script went, but there was something in there that indicated that would be a very good idea. And I have actually done that sort of idea a number of times on, on later editions. It, it's, it's just fascinating because your work is so detailed and I'm imagining that well, it just seems to me that you are perhaps a perfectionist. You're always looking to make sure that every line is right and every detail is correct. So, you know, when you are given an assignment, whether it's sequential work uh, or it's a cover, um, how do you sort of divide that time so that, you know, you can make sure that it's done and gets, you know, to print on time uh, and, and still be satisfied with your work as, as an artist? Well, I mean, in my case, it was always, um, um, there was always a dilemma. I, when I first started drawing comics um, in the mid 70s uh, in Britain, I had to draw as quickly as possible. And I knew that if I had a little bit more time, I could do it better. As I moved into doing work in 2008, drawing Judge Dredd, they knew that I was not the quickest artist uh, of the bunch. And I did a, a little short series called Judge Death. And they knew that they would have to give me a little extra time. The um, the artists in 2000 AD, the British comic, um, the stories were, the, the issues came out weekly and the stories, the episodes were 
up to something like five pages long. So, so they could have a bunch of artists, um, they'd have one artist working on one story and meanwhile another artist would be taking as long as was necessary to do his uh, segment or his story. And I, uh, I was given three weeks or so to draw 30 pages. I, well, no, I, don't, I don't think I could possibly have done 30 pages in three weeks, but I was given extra time to, to, to finish that stuff. And, and now that I'm, I, I say I'm retired, I've been retired, I say for two years, although I've been as busy in this last two years as I've ever been, um, I now have the luxury of, of taking as much time to do the thing as possible. And I, I think if I were required to be a proper comic artist, somebody who could actually draw 25 pages in a month, I, it wouldn't look like what I do. Um, I'm, I spend at least a week on just about everything I do nowadays. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I, I don't know whether you call me a, a, a perfectionist. I'm, a, I'm more of an obsessive, you know. I, I mean, once that part of the drawing is drawn with a certain amount of detail, the rest of the drawing has to continue to be drawn in the same degree of detail. So it just takes as long as it takes to to finish the thing. But you know, I can see I can see errors. You know, every time I, you can't call me a perfectionist because I can, looking at some of the covers I have stuck to the wall there, I can I can see things that I could have done a lot better. And does that drive you as an artist? Because there's there's always something that you see that that you could do better, uh, and there's always that you know, desire to get better and better every time you do something? I don't think I could get any better. I think I've peaked. I think I probably peaked 20 or, 20 or so years ago. I don't, I don't think I could, well, I'm saying, I don't think I could get, could, could get any better. I've, I've leveled, I, I've arrived at the level of ability that I have, and I don't think it's going to get any better. I mean, nowadays, um, as a cover artist, the beauty of, some people wouldn't like this at all, but I find the thing I love the most is that I can spend as long as I, need on one piece of work it may be batman and then the next week i'm drawing the steel claw who is a vintage british comic character or i can be drawing barbarella and uh, I, I do love that i think a lot of people really enjoy the continuity of the story i like the change from one i've just recently drawn swamp thing for instance it's it's a great um joy to be able to do something finish with it and then try drawing another character. And you had mentioned um, uh, Camelot uh, 3000, which is um, one of those, I guess it was DC's first uh, mini series. And it, it's the introduction that I had to your artwork. I came across a collection of it and I, I was blown away. I think it was, it was either that or as Batman 400 where you had worked in uh, some pages to complete that story. But yes. your artwork was, was one of those things that for, for me looking at the Marvel style of let's say John Buscema, who I absolutely love, your artwork mm -hmm. was was com a completely different world, and I'm just wondering when you're working on uh, you know some sequential pages and, and whatnot, are you drawing inspiration from someone like uh, John Buscema, or are you taking an influence from maybe a, a British comic that you know American readers aren't aware of? Okay, well, I grew up. Um, my first love was American comics. I, I, in fact, I have the very first American comic I ever bought. Right, right here, the Dinosaurus yeah. from 1960. But the British comics were drawn; they were mainly in black and white. And a lot of the artists we had in our comics were from Spain, Italy, all over the place. And the style was completely different. So when I first started drawing in British comics, um, myself and Dave Gibbons, I would say, were the two people who were most influenced by America. We'd both grown up reading DC and Marvel. And so my style of drawing was more in the American style than had previously been the thing in British comics. And, and, and so I, I suppose drawing Judge Dredd, it, it didn't require me to draw in the Marvel superhero style. It, 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 there was a kind of fusion of the British and European black and white artwork style of the artists at the time. And uh, people like Gil Kane, I grew up on the work, of, I loved Gil Kane's work and later Neil Adams and all of the American great artists. Um, so I think my, what I do is a sort of a fusion of a number of different styles from uh, around the world. What do you think? <laughs> well, it's interesting. So, I, I can see, uh, you know, the, the influence of Neil Adams with that that more realistic style. And, and one of the things I, I was looking uh, before our conversation, I did 
uh, just look back at some pages uh, of mine that I, uh, of yours rather, that are favorites of mine. And I was looking back at some of your work on, let's say, uh, the, the Killing Joke, where the Joker is wearing a glove and his hand is holding something just a certain way, and it, it looks, well, it looks really realistic. And when you see that in a comic, uh, at least for me, as somebody who's reading comics heavily in the 80s, it was, you know, one of those mind-blowing uh, uh, events. Um, as yeah. I realized that there, there's just so much more to do uh, with the medium. So when you're doing something as mundane as, as a person's hand, uh, holding the lens of a camera, are you using a lot of yep. photo references or are you just, you know, it's in you and you can just kind of put it on paper? I do tend to use photo reference for my hands. I, I mean, I, I, I have a mirror in front of me and I can often sort of um, pose my hands and various bits of myself uh, in, in the mirror so I can see what hands look like. Um, and most, uh, I think some people do rather slavishly use photographic reference. And I do personally find that a little bit tiresome to have when the, when the, the, the drawing is very much based on photography. I do occasionally use a bit of a photo reference, like, um, for instance, when I'm having to draw a suit, um, a person in a suit or somebody in a particular form of dress, I will need to know what that looks like. But I believe some artists actually use models. I, I've never used a model. Um, so, so I would say my work is 70 to 80 percent made up. And there, there's a little element of photo reference in there, especially when it comes to hands. And, and facial expressions, too, I would say, as well. I think um, uh, Lee Weeks said uh, recently that if you can get the eyes and the hands right, and he was, I think, quoting Joe Kubert, he said, if you can get the hands and eyes right, you can fudge the rest because the audience... Yeah, that's, that is true. I always, <laughs> I always start with, which eye is that? Well, I, I always start with the, well, the left eye on the, on the figure, and then if you can get the, both eyes right, you, the rest is less crucial, isn't it? So I agree with him on that, but that's how I start. And it's interesting that you were holding up a comic uh, from Dell, which is, uh, I don't even think they're around anymore, but they had uh, some oh, no. licensed comics. And, and I think that one was called Dinosaur. Uh, and I have some comics yes. on, on the set here that I remember from my childhood. Yes. You know, when you look back at those comics, uh, are you able to look past maybe the art not being the level of it, let's say a Jack Kirby, uh, and, and still just kind of enjoy it as an adult, say, you know, there's the nostalgia, there's the fun, there's, there's everything that I love about oh, yeah. Well, uh, well uh, to be quite honest, I'm, I'm very uh, loyal to a lot of the artists I liked at the time. I was a great admirer of, of Bruno Primiani, who drew Doom Patrol in 1966 on. He was quite a mature man when he came to, to DC to draw Doom Patrol. He was in his mid 50s, I believe. Um, Gil Kane's work still looks great. Alex Toth, for me, is the great master of, of American comics. Uh, um, I think a lot of the artists uh, of my generation hold him up as the best. I mean, he really knows how to compose a, a panel, a page. Um, he knows how to interplay the, the black and the white, the chiaroscura effects. And his drawing is, some people think it's simple. They call it simple, but to, to, to be able to strip away the extraneous detail the way he did and just get back to what works the best is, is so good. I also love the work of uh, Dick Sprang, who was drawing Batman in the 50s during the sort of silly creature Batman phase of the, of the 50s. So uh, those artists are still uh, excellent in my, in my view. And then, of course, in the very late 60s, 70s, uh, Neil Adams came along with the, as you might say, a realistic style, but it was realistic. It was more realistic and well observed, but it was also more dynamic. It, was, it didn't lose any of the dynamism that you would get from a Kirby or some, or one of the Marvel artists, for instance. In fact, it was more so. It had more um, explosive action going on it, it, it while being realistically observed and a lot of difficult difficult um, um, foreshortening and tilted head effects and you know so, so good oh I, I agree and 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 Toth is he did the character designs for one of the the great Saturday morning cartoons of my youth the super friends and to this right. day I can't look at those shows without seeing a master at work um, and I think yeah. to that that great black canary story he did where it's just some great panel layout and 
like you say, it may look simple, but it's, I guess, knowing what not to put in. Yes. No, no I liked his work before that. I, I didn't see Super Friends, but that, his work did drift into the cartoony sort of, um, uh, sort of style a little bit too much for me. I much preferred his um, mystery, DC mystery book period. His Bravo for Adventure is his masterpiece, I believe and Zorro, he drew Zorro, and countless other things. And I think he was one of those artists who, many artists you think, well, Jack Kirby, that's the Fantastic Four or whatever, uh, um, Ditko is Spider-Man, but with Alex Toth, you couldn't really place him as the artist on any one long running thing, really, can you? He did the Bravo for Adventure and he did Zorro, but he dotted around all over the place, drawing a story here, a story there. He drew Hot Wheels for DC beautifully. He drew a couple of Rip Hunter time masters for DC in the mid 60s, I believe. Um, you just had to find it where you found him. Um, Let's just uh, go back to uh, The Killing Joke for a moment, if we can. I know you probably talked about please. this book for, for years and years. Um, I've hardly ever spoken about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the, the things that just dazzles me uh, about the artwork is the way you are able to do simple, th what, what seems like simple things like rain puddling uh, as it hits the ground uh, yeah. or the reflection of lights from a, a carnival in that puddle. Yeah. So when you're doing something like that, it seems like it's something that, that you see and you're able to put on paper and there's a magic to it. But for me, I, I look at rain and I think, well, it's got to look like a line coming down. So I'm just wondering, you know, from your artistic yeah. point of view, how are you approaching something as mundane as rain or as explosive as, you know, the Batmobile uh, as you are designing the world that the characters live in? I have made this massive transition from working on in ink with a brush on paper to the computer. And, and the killing joke was drawn, you know, with a brush on, on paper. So um, look at John, I mean, I've been doing that for over 20 years. Uh, I've been working digitally for over 20 years. So looking back, uh, I'm trying to remember. I mean, there was a time when you could draw rain with a scalpel. I remember you could you could do your drawing and then you'd get a steel edged ruler and take a scalpel and just scratch the page. Um, and that would give the impression of rain falling. But I don't think I was, I certainly didn't do that for, for this. I did have a tendency, um, I, I never liked using white out. I always, if there was some white line somewhere on a black background, I would be drawing the spaces between the, the white lines, it's particularly hair, Wonder Woman's hair, for instance. Um, it was never a black mass with a lot of white drawn in for highlights. It was always me drawing the black around the white. I spent more time drawing Wonder Woman's hair than I would, would spend on any other part of the drawing. But in the case of those puddles, it, the same thing applied, really. I mean, the, the script, Alan Moore's script required that opening scene. Uh, it's not that difficult to know what a puddle of rain looks like. It's not the most complicated thing I've ever drawn. But thank you for pointing it out anyway. <laughs> I, I do have a tendency to, uh, to point out the arcane sometimes. Um, oh, now, that's brilliant, why not? Now, you mentioned that you, are, that you are working digitally, but you used to ink with a brush. And if I looked at your work, yes. I would think that for the most part, you were maybe yes. doing like crow quill and then maybe fattening up some lines with, with a brush. But was that sort of how no, you were No, no, I, I drew everything with the same um, Winsor & Newton Siri. I think it was called Siri, um, Siri, uh, well, it was a number three Winsor & Newton brush. Um, everything I drew was with, I never learned to use a pen. When I was a kid, I used to draw with a ballpoint pen. And then I discovered the repeatograph. Remember those? But when I first started working professionally, um, I, I think Dave Gibbons and I started working on a thing called Power Man, published in Nigeria, actually. And it was then that I dis discovered I, I really... I had to choose what tool to use and it, it became the brush. But all of those lines um, are, were drawn with a brush. And I believe, and I mean, a lot of artists use a pen. I've never done it. I believe um, Dick Giordano, who was a very fine inker, used a brush, and, but his lines, I could be wrong. I, I, you know, if that's, if that's not the case, then I stand corrected. But I, 
I have a feeling that that's the case. No, I used to brush. That, that's amazing because, I mean, I've spoken to other inkers or inkers who would talk about how they could do just about anything with their brush, uh, do the, the you know, panel lines and everything else. Uh, it, it just marvels, it amazes me that, that the detail that you're able to put in with that brush, uh, the number three, uh, is, is sort of yes. that intermediate. Uh, you know, you can get a nice fine line, but you can also get a nice strong line there. So being able to do some really yes. delicate line work. I suspect, I, I suspect the panel borders would have been done with a pen of some, or a pedograph of some sort. I don't really remember. I mean, I've got, I've got one here. I mean, that's a, that's a Judge Dredd. That's all brush. <laughs> that yeah. looks fantastic. Um, and there's another, this is artwork, by the way. Um, that's all done with a brush. That is, that is amazing. Uh, that, I mean, it just speaks to the control. And I understand that, you know, years of training and, and practice would get you there. Um, uh, as a hobby cartoonist myself, uh, I'm lucky that I can sit down and occasionally, you know, dip a, yeah. a pen into some ink or a brush into some ink and, and have some fun. Now, you mentioned that yeah. you're working digitally now. So I'm wondering if you could talk yes. a little bit about that, uh, the, the way yes. that you work now, because it seems a lot faster, but also you could get bogged down in the detail a little bit more. Yes, people people do ask that. They, they say, now that you're working in Photoshop, I, I work in Photoshop, there are a lot of other um, apps, I would suppose you call them apps for, Manga Studio, for instance, was a very popular one. I believe it's called something else now. D Dave Gibbons, I, I, I'm always referencing Dave because uh, he and I, we go back a long way. He was the one who actually suggested I switch to working on in Photoshop. Um, now I've forgotten exactly what the question was, but um, just refresh it for me. Sure, it's, it's just about the, the change in approach and, and how do you stop you oh, know, yeah. from maybe putting too much in? Well, that is the danger, you see, because I work at 600 dots. I mean, this, this could get very technical for people who are not into that sort of thing, but I work um, art, um, printed page size, but at 600 dots per inch. Now, on my screen, um, I have one, I'm going to do this like this. I have one window taking up about two thirds of the screen, which I blow up to 200%. Uh, um, and I have another little one on the corner, which is the entire page, um, so that I can see what the whole page looks like. Now on the big window, I'm drawing the detail. It might be an eye or something like that. Um, and, and yes, I am using a Wacom tablet with a, a pen to draw the line, to draw everything actually. The, to, the rough uh, is drawn very loosely um, with the, the, the layer reduced down to 50 or 45 percent so it looks like a pencil it's got a paleness like a pencil line um, that can be done very quickly but then a layer goes over the top of that which i call the ink layer um, and i use a pencil tool to because it has a um, non-anti-aliased edge uh, to, to draw the ink line but at 600 dots per inch you can't see the little little pixels um, when the thing is reduced to print size, you can on this big screen I'm using. You can see, you can draw, you can see all the little pixels you're drawing. But by the time you're back down to the print-sized version, you, it, it looks like just an ink line on a piece of paper. Really. That's interesting. I I would never have thought that you could just have the page that you're working on so you can see the whole thing in a smaller size, yeah. so that way you don't muddy it up a little bit. That's that's brilliant. That's right. You can have you know, t two images of the same drawing. But at two, you know, in two different windows, but at different sizes, yeah, very handy. Well, that that is fantastic. Now I see that they're telling me we have about three minutes left in our conversation, and oh, okay. the the problem is that there's so many different directions that I would love to go with uh, to to our, continue our conversation. Um, so I'm just going to go uh, back to uh, your artwork uh, and those covers that you do. Um, yeah. So when you're doing something now uh, on the digital. Uh, tablet, are you able to give everything to the, the publisher where it's going to be inks and, and color and, and maybe even the, the graphics that they want? Or are you still just giving them the black and white and they're going to send it to maybe one of their... No, no, no. I, nowadays I do everything. I, I've become very precious about, you know, I, I, I didn't really like other people inking my work. And I, I, I switched to working on, in Photoshop because I, I wanted to color the thing myself. So nowadays I, I turn in full color artwork. I, 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 I do the rough, the, 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 the pale pencil version that I've described at the beginning, which I then email to the editor just so to get his or her approval. Um, 
but the finished product is um, in full color. It's in CMYK full color. I sent it as a TIFF over one of these large file sharing platforms. But I also, since my work, um, the line, the, the line to me has to look okay even before I put the color on. I send the full color version to the editor and also the line version. Sometimes they make you, occasionally we do these things called variant covers where, you know, um, potential customers are induced to buy two copies of the same thing, which is a bit of a cheat really, but they can buy the full color cover version or the one which is just line. Um, so I can supply um, two, two versions of the same bit of artwork. I say artwork, but it is, it's actually a file, isn't it? Well, Brian, they are telling me that we've run out of time. I want to thank you so oh, much. Oh, darn. Oh, <laughs> darn. <laughs> I okay, want to thank you so much on. for taking time out and to talk with me today. Well, it's been a great pleasure. I'm sorry we couldn't go on for longer. Maybe uh, some other time. Hopefully we can. I'd like to thank everyone at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.